what I want to do, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, when Alan first called and talked about what a deal exchange was all about, I, I thought it was absolutely a fascinating, logical next step uh, in EO's history. And I was never an EO member, only because I was never aware of it back at the time. Vern and I have been friends for years, uh, so I've always known about it, but uh, I try to support it in many different ways. And so here is our, oops, uh, I guess we need the slides up there. No one wants to see that, so you don't have to go back to that. <laughs> Just leave the slides up. Um, and that was one of my slides, okay. Uh, I, I want to I first give you guys a little bit of background. And, and then our topic today is two things. First, I want to talk about the power of entrepreneurship, right? Why is this important? Why does entrepreneurship matter? Why is this such a big deal? And then we'll talk more about how the deal part of this fits into it and why it's so critical for an entrepreneur's ability to succeed. So I want to start by telling you uh, some of what I've been doing the last few years. And I have been spending all of my time with entrepreneurs. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is that I finally feel like I have a sample size. Um, we determined, uh, I've taken the last almost six years off just my commitment to giving back by mentoring entrepreneurs around the world. Um, and in six years, we determined that we have worked with uh, thousands of startups and entrepreneurs and growth companies, and we've now uh, worked with entrepreneurs in 100 different countries, including obviously all over the US. But I finally feel confident in talking about what I'm talking about because there's a sample size now. We've looked at thousands of companies all over the world for years to find out the impact they make and what they need to make that impact. So some of the places I do that, this is Global Entrepreneurship Network. Um, I am on the board of the Global Entrepreneurship Network and involved in it since the beginning. Global Entrepreneurship Network is now networked in 176 countries. If you don't know us, Global Entrepreneurship Week is our event. Uh, and, and Global Entrepreneurship Network and Global Entrepreneurship Week is different than EO, and that's why I do them both, because this is about building ecosystems around entrepreneurs. It doesn't serve the entrepreneur, it creates the ecosystem around it. But we have expanded to these 176 countries, and I'll give you an example. To promote the importance and awareness of entrepreneurs, last year at Global Ent Entrepreneurship Week, we asked people all over the world to hold an event where they live to promote and sponsor the awareness of entrepreneurs. We had 30,000 events last year in 165 countries and 10 million people attended. So we're getting the word out about how important entrepreneurship is and I've been visiting these countries all over the world and entrepreneurs to study what they need to succeed. Um, I'm also part of another organization that I'm a partner and board member in that's right down the street here in Boulder. It's called the Unreasonable Group. It is named after, you guys probably know, when we first started the Unreasonable Institute, it's named after the George Bernard Shaw quote. If you all don't know it, uh, he said that a reasonable person adapts themselves to the world around them. An unreasonable person expects the whole world to adapt to them. Therefore, all progress is dependent upon unreasonable people. So what we said was, if, you, if you've never been called crazy, you're just not pushing the limit, right? If you've, no one's ever told you you're a dreamer and your ideas are crazy, you're not trying hard enough. And if the world tells you you're crazy, you got two choices, conform or just go find all the other crazy people like this room right now. So what we said was let's go build a place where all the people crazy enough to think they can change the world have an opportunity to do it. Um, it's literally based in Boulder, but just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we do, we tried a grand experiment. We decided to chart a ship, fill it full of entrepreneurs, and prove that entrepreneurs are the single greatest source of change and progress in the world. That's the ship. We actually did it. We charted a ship, we filled it full of entrepreneurs, we literally circumnavigated the planet Earth. It took uh, 105 days, I always tell people, Earth needs to have a little sticker that says planet is larger than it appears because I didn't think it was going to take that long. And we showed them the problems all over the world. The fifth deck of that ship was an incubator, an accelerator, and we let them launch companies. That's what entrepreneurs do, like Alan said, to solve problems that they saw around the world. Lastly, I'll mention that I do everything I can. That's GLC. Uh, when I was on stage at GLC, I support EO everywhere that I can. I literally just came back from a trip, that's why I'm so surprised to see Boo Boo here, um, where I went to visit EO chapters, do talks and mentoring. Let's see, I did EO Singapore, EO Malaysia, EO Indonesia, EO Thailand. 
um, EO Hong Kong, and EO Philippines, where Boo Boo took me diving. If you go look at my social media, there's a picture right now that says diving with entrepreneurs. That's her and I diving with EO members at the EO Philippines chapter. So thank you again for an absolutely wonderful trip. Um, before that, I did one, uh, I've been doing EO chapters all over the US, and I did one where I did EO, uh, let's see, Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, excuse me, um, Riyadh, Jeddah, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain. Uh, so I've been s spending my time with EOers all over the world and all over the country to listen and to learn. So that's why I am confident, and, and I already mentioned to you that I took the last six years off. But I, I'll just tell you guys, I made a one-year commitment to give back to entrepreneurship to the field. I never considered entrepreneurship a job. I always considered it a privilege, right? My friends say, man, I got to go to work. And I always would say, really? Because I get to go to work, right? I actually do stuff I love doing. That's the beauty of an entrepreneur. It's a privilege, uh, you know, not a job, not a requirement. And so entrepreneur, my choice to become an entrepreneur allowed me to live a life and have impact in ways I never really dreamed of. So as a result, I made a commitment to giving back to entrepreneurship, doing the only thing I could do, which was mentoring entrepreneurs. So in 2012, I had one more company. We had a company, that, another startup called ubid.com. This is well after Priceline. Ubid became the fifth largest auction site in the world. We, uh, it became a multi-billion dollar company. We took that one public. Uh, and, and I finally said, look, what I want to do is teach, and I'm saying this because I'm challenging you to do it, if we all shared the skills we have of how to turn ideas into solutions and how to wrap a company around that so that you can get that solution actually implemented and scaled, the world will become a much better place much faster. So I made a commitment to taking 2012 off to mentor entrepreneurs around the world. Um, and that was supposed to be, I'm in year six of my one year commitment. I've spent the last six years just traveling around mentoring entrepreneurs, but a huge chunk of that has been with EO. So this is what's written on my wall at home. I have a wall where I write down the things that mean something to me. I fundamentally believe this, okay? This is what drives me every single day. When my friends say to me, why don't you just retire, uh, go golf or something? By the way, I, I've told people this before. The reason I don't golf is because it's not a sport if you can't play defense. Um, if you could block other golfers' shots with your club, I would totally <laughs> golf. But to just stand there and watch people beat me, that ain't a sport. Um, this is the reason I just can't stop, uh, because this is true. Um, if, we, if we continue to create more entrepreneurs, and the reason we're here for deal exchange is to get them what they need to succeed, the world will become a better place. Again, that's sort of my fundamental driving belief. Why? Because entrepreneurs are problem solvers. And by the way, here's another reason why something like deal exchange is so important. The best entrepreneurs are totally focused on the problem, not on, what I don't like is today, people call me up and say, I made a decision, I'm an entrepreneur now. And I say, what does that mean? And they say, I got an office, I got a business card, I got a website. I was like, you got everything but an idea, right? It's backwards. Entrepreneurship is not the goal, it's just a tool set. It's a mindset. The goal should be to make something in the be world better. I'm gonna tell you in a minute about my first company, I wasn't smart enough to know this, but looking back, I get it now. I had an idea, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. I started my first company, I, was, I would get up at three in the morning and I'd say, geez, it's only three, and I'd say, I'm just gonna lay here and think about this the rest of the morning anyway, I might as well go to the office, right? Obsessed with building a product to fix a problem. And one day, a friend of mine came in, and he said, Jeff, he said, I got some good news uh, and bad news. So what's the good news? He said, I have a friend who's in the deal business. He's an investor. I told him what you're doing and he wants to give you money. I said, that's great, what's the bad news? He said, dude, you don't have a bank account. And I said, look, I'm an engineer, I'm trying to build this thing, I don't have time for crap like that, get me a bank account. And he said, there's more bad news. And I said, what? He said, I can't get you a bank account because you don't even have a company. And I was like, what on earth do I need a company for? And he said, Jeff, I said, I just want to fix this problem. He said, you have to have a company so you can get a bank account and you can get a license to hire all this stuff that wraps around solving the problem. The entrepreneur, the ones that succeed, all they can, they obsess about solving the problem. What we as a community need to do is build everything around them. And I'm gonna give an example of that so that they can get it done. They will solve the problem, but they can't, literally can't do it alone. The beauty of entrepreneurs 
and again, I say this nearly 100 countries later, is that entrepreneurs are the ones that see the world the way it is, but they also vision the way it should be. And they're the ones that say, I'm gonna go create that reality, right? I'm gonna turn the world from the way it is to the way that it should be. And I'm gonna give you some examples of some of that, but every day in every city, in all of your regions, and all over the world, there are unsung heroes that, that can see what the future looks like, and they'll do everything they can to create that better world. They just need our help to do it. Um, that's the beauty of it. And it's not about, by the way, here's another valuable lesson I've learned. The entrepreneurs that are focused all about the money, they don't succeed. They're so distracted by the pursuit of money that they fail to do the one and only thing that you need to do to get money, which is to achieve excellence. In fact, I have another thing on my wall that says, don't chase money, chase excellence. Money follows excellence. What we need to do is have them heads down focused on excellence. Until and unless you create something amazing in the world, you're not making any money anyway. People always say, and you guys, we shouldn't do this to any startup or entrepreneur. People say to entrepreneurs early in their company's life, what's your exit strategy? And you know what I always sit there thinking? What is your entrance strategy? What are you exiting, a PowerPoint? Your one sale? There's nothing to exit until you create amazing in the world. So we need them to be able to focus on building something amazing and we'll take care of all the deals that gotta be put together around that so they can create excellence in the world. When you create excellence, the money shows up. And, and so we want them to focus on designing the future and on solving the problem because that's what entrepreneurship is really about. And here's another reason why this particular group is so important because there are a lot of experience. There are a lot of scars in this room and there are a lot of bottles of champagne in this room. And the rest of our community, EOers all over the world, need that from us, right? That's why when Alan called me, I thought it was important to be here too because this is the important launch of a very important mission. Everybody has an idea, but nobody on the planet really knows how to execute. When you see people that are really successful, companies that are really successful, in hindsight, they look really, they look smarter than you, right? And you look at them and say, oh, well, she was just way smarter. Or he had money or he had connections. You know what? The truth is most of the time they didn't, they just executed. Right? They were just the people that got up and got it done. In fact, I'm going to show you another thing. This was written on the entrance to my office. Uh, I tell people all the time, your ideas are welcome here, but execution is worshipped. I hear ideas all day, everywhere I go, all around the world. Everybody's got an idea and nobody knows how to execute. Executing, right? literally knowing how to create a company and how to execute deals, we're going to talk about that, is the key to success. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. you got to be the one that just gets it done. And I can't tell you, in fact, I'll tell you a funny story. There is a uh, friend of mine, I will not say his name. You all know him, very famous, multi-billionaire. And when he and I became friends, I walked out one day thinking to myself, wait a minute, if that dumbass can do that, okay? And I'm not actually saying that disrespectfully. This is a guy that I think on that TV show, are you smarter than a fifth grader? No, he might get beat a third grader. And yet his products are household name, he's a multi-billionaire, and you'd all know if I knew it. And when I spent a lot of time with him, what I discovered is he was never the brightest person in the world. He was the one that executed. He was the one that fought through every obstacle, that was smart enough to go get help, that was smart enough to get people that put deals together around him, to be, become part of networks like this and mentorship and organizations, and he executed. So when I looked at that, that was a huge lesson to me, uh, that it's really all about that. But people don't know how to do that. And we have to help them. One of the things that I <coughs> excuse me, learned in this, uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. In this country, and especially in the West, but in, in America, we're very ethnocentric, right? We think, especially in the U.S., we must be smarter than everyone else because where are all the really innovative companies? Apple, right? Uh, Google, I mean, pick a company, even Facebook, whatever, the Zuckerbergs, the Steve Jobs, they're all in this country, so we must be smarter than everyone else because all those big, great companies are in this country. Here's what I learned. We were never smarter than everyone else, right? Good intelligence is equally distributed across the entire planet Earth. Opportunity is not. That's what we have to create with something like deal exchange. I wound up, and I'm going to tell you the story of a young man in West Africa soon, but Everybody always had good ideas. They just never had the tool set. What we had in this country 
was Zuckerberg or pick one, Steve Jobs. These are smart people, but there are Steve Jobs in every country. There are people just as smart. They have never had an opportunity in the past to be able to create anymore. So, like I said, these people never had the tools to, they, to execute, and now they do. And I want to give you an example. So when I made that commitment that I told you guys about, I did something I didn't tell people. In 2012, um, after my last company, uh, after we scaled that company, when I, when I made that commitment to giving back, I decided to take one year off. And for one year, this is the way I was going to give back. I was going to say yes to any entrepreneur anywhere in the world that asked me for anything for one year, but I told nobody I was doing this. And so wherever the phone rang, that meant I will not make one dollar, I will not go to my office, I won't do any business, and I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. So here's what happened. The second thing I got was an email from West Africa from a 19-year-old guy. By the way, the way the email really started was it said, Dear Mr. Hoffman, I know you won't read this, and if you do, I know you won't reply. So it was on. Okay, because I was like, wait a minute. So I flew to a village. My commitment was I'm saying yes to everybody for a year. So I flew to West Africa to this village. I don't know if you can see that, but their houses are made out of caked mud. Okay, there is no electricity. There is no water. There's one room. The floors are made out of dirt. Actually, I have a hilarious video, video because their daughter, they staged this. I came outside and their daughter was on the donkey cart pretending to cuss. I said, what's wrong? And she said, I lost my car charger again. And they all started laughing and she said, stupid first world problems. They did that for me that it was kind of funny. So I go all the way to this village and there's this 19 year old young man. He comes in from the fields because by the way, in West Africa, in that part of the world, if you don't grow food, you don't eat. There is no grocery store. There's no distribution. They have to make food. So everybody works in the fields all day. And I have to tell you something. He said, I have an idea. I have an idea how to make life better for the people around me and get them out of living like that. I want to save my village. And he said, but I need help. I don't know what to do next. I don't know how to do deals. I don't know how to put it together. Will you come? So I flew to West Africa. And I'm in the village. And I'll be honest with you guys. The day before, the week, excuse me, the week before, I had given a speech at, in Silicon Valley. I had been asked to come out and speak at, Stan, at Stanford, which, by the way, uh, you're from Ohio? Who was from, oh, okay, because um, that's where I'm from, and I thought it was particularly funny. I went on stage, and I said, really? I'm in Silicon Valley at Stanford, and you had to fly a guy in from Ohio to tell you guys how to innovate? I got quite a bit of mileage out of that. But I was at Stanford, and I was in Silicon Valley, and I visited with the founders of Google and a lot of people like that. So I get to that, what do you think my expectation is, right? Well, wow, what kind of idea could this guy have? So he... <laughs> Actually, first he rubs his eyes. He goes, there's no way you're standing here. I said, dude, you did invite me, right? Because I just flew 30 hours. I hope that wasn't a joke. And he said, I did. And I said, tell me your idea. So he starts telling me, I want to make life better in the villages. And this is the idea that I have, right? He said, I want to create change. I want to get people houses. I want to get people jobs. And I got to do that by creating value and running a profitable business. I said, let's hear the idea. So he starts talking. And he's telling me the idea. And I go, wait a minute. I have to tell you guys, if I closed my eyes and forgot that I was sitting on a dirt floor in a village with no electricity and plumbing, um, and forgot the accent, and by the way, even, see that goat? There was a goat that was literally eating my pants the whole time. And I was like shoving the goat away, and he was like, can you not touch the goat? That's our food source. And I was like, can you not eat my pants? That's my clothing source, right? If you take the goat out of the picture and the accent, this kid was more brilliant than anybody I just met in all of Silicon Valley. I was blown away. And I said, OK, time out. Stop. And I said, I got to ask you something. I said, where on earth would you have learned any of that? And he said, oh, that's easy. Stanford courses and MIT. I said, then you lied to me. You're not a kid in a village in Africa. You went to Stanford and you went to MIT? He said, no. He said, Mr. Hoffman, I want a better life. And I want to build things and solve problems and make things better. So because I want a better life, he said, I work in the fields all day. But at night, I walk an hour into the village. I go to the internet cafe. And I spend all night taking free Stanford and MIT classes on Coursera. He said, that's where I learned that stuff. I said, impressive. <clears throat> Carry on. So I said, what's your go-to-market plan? Expecting to have to explain that. He said, let me tell you the go-to-market strategy. And he starts pitching me again. And I said, all right, stop, time out again. 
I said, There's no, this is really practical stuff. You didn't learn this in an MIT class or anything that was academic. I said, so who really taught you this? Where did you learn all this practical stuff? And he said, Mr. Hoffman, I want a better life, and I want to achieve that through building profitable businesses that solve problems and make things better. So after I work in the fields, and after I take Coursera classes, he said, I watch TED Talks in the middle of the night. And he said, and think about it, guys. Who gives a TED Talk? Only the most decorated expert of that thing in the world. So if you want to learn, watch a TED Talk, because the person who's best at that thing in the world gave that TED Talk, most likely. Makes a lot of sense. He said, by the way, it was interesting. He said, guess what? That's how I found you. I have a TED Talk about the power of childlike wonder. He said, I watched your TED Talk. I emailed you, and now you're standing in my village. That couldn't have even happened a few years ago. Right? None of that existed. So he said, let me show you the investor pitch, because I need a deal. And he said, I, and he started showing it to me. I said, all right, you're busted. No way in hell did you write this investor deck. And I, I said, it's better than 90% of what I see in the United States. He said, I did. And I said, how? And he said, I told you, I want a better life. And I told you, I'm going to find a way to get there. So after I take Coursera classes and walk TED, watch TED Talks, he said, every Friday I go on SlideShare. If you've never been on SlideShare, they post the 10 best presentations in the world that anybody gave on any topic. He said, I read the 10, every Friday I read the 10 best investor pitches in the world, and I learned what the best investor pitch looks like. The kid was brilliant. Today, anybody can entrepreneur. But you know what he needed help doing? He needed help putting all that together, okay? I gotta tell you something, I've been mentoring, uh, his name's Mustafa, ever since then. His company today employs 350 people in seven West African nations. We got, just did a huge deal for, for Vodafone, for the phone company over in that part of the world, bought a fourth of the company and infused it with millions of dollars. He not only employs 350 people, but his company is so profitable he builds them housing. So they live in real houses with plumbing and electricity now. 350 families, his village had 19. That was his starting point. And last time I went, he picked me up in a brand new BMW in a suit with a leather briefcase. I was like, dude, really? And he said, you told me to look the part when I'm going out to do deals. And I said, okay, fine, I did. Actually tell him to do that before we went to this meeting. Incredible what entrepreneurship can do to change the world. Everybody's got ideas. We gotta help them put the deal together and execute. Um, <clears throat> like I said, entrepreneurs need all the help they can get. And I added that last one because I'm amazed at how many times the solution is in the community. It's in your forum, it's in the chapter, and you just don't listen. And obviously, I don't mean you literally. I did mean you, actually. Just kidding. Um, um, <laughs> I did mean you. Um, people, the solution's there. It's in our community. One of everything that's ever happened has happened to some EO member, okay? The network is that big and that powerful. Something that you need to do, someone in EO has already done it. We gotta make those connections happen. But the smart entrepreneurs take that advice. They look for that advice. I think, by the way, and I'm saying this as a non-EO member, I think forums are one of the most successful things. And I work with all kinds of entrepreneurial organizations all over the world, not just EO. Forums actually work. People actually help each other, which is a pretty amazing thing. Um, so we gotta help, we just gotta spread that. We gotta help the people that haven't found us yet, right? And the people that you haven't talked to across our network, we need to do that. So why are we here today? And, and I think I just illustrated that because it really does take a village. Uh, for any given startup to succeed, it takes a lot more than an idea and some passion. Those are the core starting requirements. But to really scale and become profitable like Mustafa did, we had to put in West Africa, there's a lot of deals that have to be done. And there's a lot of pieces that have to be assembled. So I want to illustrate that just by showing my first startup that I mentioned earlier. Um, I was, I'm a software engineer by trade. I, when I graduated from school, so I started a, a, a tech startup when I was in college. I funded, I wanted to go to Yale, and my family had no money. I had a single mom with no money. Um, and everybody told me, just go to the local community college, and I wasn't gonna do that. So I actually went to Yale anyway, and they kicked me out on day one. They're like, there's this whole thing where you have to pay before you can go to school here. I said, yeah, about that. And they said, yeah, there's no about that, go home. So I didn't go home. I stayed on campus, I started a company, I started making payments, and they let me back in. Through a startup, I funded my entire education at Yale, but a thought occurred to me, right? Learning the skills of entrepreneurship, how to build 
a, a, a profitable company, how to turn an idea into a business and build all the pieces around it, actually worked. I started making deals and I was completely green, right? Deals with companies to put this together. But when I left, I said, this is a good formula. I just wish somebody could have helped me with so many parts of this because I made so many mistakes since I was in it entirely by myself. But when I left, I got an engineering job because my parents gave me so much pressure. You need to, you know, you guys have all heard this. My whole life, all I've heard is, why can't you just get a job like everybody else? And you know, I used to tell people, this is my job, right? If I had a business card, it never would have said entrepreneur. I never knew that word. I still can't even spell that word without a spell check. My business card my whole life would have said problem solver. And back then, people would say, what do you do? I'd say, I'm an entrepreneur. And they'd say, oh, they'd wink, say, oh, you're a hustler, huh? And I'd say, well, you're making it sound bad, right? I hustle, but I'm not a hustler. This is legal work. And they'd say, oh, we get it. You got fired. And I'd say, no, no, no. I do this by choice. Ah, you lot, you can't find another job? I said, I have a job. This is my job. And it was amazing that that is not the way. In fact, I, my first startup that I'm about to tell you about, in the fall, like around, I don't know, October, my stepfather came to me and said, what are you working on? And I said, this thing. And in December, we sold it. So we came back in February a few months later. He said, what are you working on? And I said, this. He said, wait a minute. He said, I just asked you a few months ago what you were working on, and it was completely different. I said, yes, sir. I, the company was acquired. I'm building a new one. He said, oh, boy. I said, what? He said, this is going to look really bad on your resume. <laughs> I said, huh? He said, you're a job hopper. I said, wait, people keep buying my companies. And he said, yeah, that makes you look unstable. I was like, wow. OK, that is what I grew up with. So I did get an engineering job. I hated it. I quit. I was one day, and I want to talk about, again, why I would have loved to have deal exchange, right? Because this is what it takes to succeed. I quit the job. I was unemployed, 20-something years old. I bought an airline ticket to go see a mentor, only he didn't know he was my mentor yet because I hadn't gotten to him. But he was going to be my mentor. However, I didn't get there because the line in the airport to check in back then was a zillion miles long, and I missed the flight. I was in line for an hour, and you get to the end of the line, and if you remember, all they do is say next, they look at your ID, she hits a button, hands me a boarding card. And I was like, seriously? You made me stand in this line for an hour so you could hit print? And she said, well, you have to have a boarding card to get on a plane. I said, right, but we're all in a giant line so you can use the printer. A boarding pass was, she's like, next? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, this is not okay. I'm never gonna miss another flight standing in line right, so you can use the printer. So that Friday I started my first startup. Uh, and that was, if you've ever checked yourself in at a kiosk somewhere at an airport in the world, except the Philippines, boo-boo, I couldn't find any in the airport there. Um, uh, 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 we created those. That was our first product. So I'm a 20-something-year-old unemployed engineer who's had one job and failed at it with an idea for how to solve a problem. That is all the people we're talking about today. That is why we are here. Entrepreneurs want to fix things and make them better. I had a vision that if I could only create those, right? And that's the product I was working on when the guy said, I got an investor for you, and I didn't have a corporate structure, I hadn't filed a company, I didn't have a bank account, I just wanted to make that thing. And I want you to keep thinking about that, because the more that we clear the path around entrepreneurs so they can just make that thing, the more likely they are to succeed, right? I don't, I'm an engineer, I don't know how to do a deal, but let me tell you what it took to succeed at a company like this. We eventually scaled this, and these things were in airports. We got a patent, so they had to buy from us. These things were, are in airports all over the world now. But here's what it took, right? You talk about deals. I started building them, and I'm a software guy. I was like, holy crap, I don't know anything about building hardware. It's a kiosk. I literally need to engineer a kiosk. I need, don't know how to do that. Manufacturing, what is that word? I didn't study any of that in school. I'm a software guy. Is there a manufacturing company I should partner with? Does somebody know somebody that knows manufacturing company? When my company starts to grow, should I acquire a small manufacturing firm and make these myself? None of that stuff. All of that is stuff you can solve for people. Testing, right? There are testing labs, there are testing companies. Is there somebody in the EO network that already owns a testing company that I could sign a deal with? Or is there a deal that maybe I should acquire one? Or one of you as an investor would want to do that? Delivery and installation, are you kidding me? The first, the second order I got, the first was United Airlines in Chicago, the second was KLM Royal Dutch Airlines in Amsterdam. And they're like, you can get them here, right? And I'm like, sure, then I hang up the phone, I was like, crap, right? I don't have the slightest clue, I don't even know what country the Dutch live in at the time. He said KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, I was like, I know that's not Germany, they're Deutsch. 
And I was, my, my, my team's like, Jeff, it's the Netherlands. I was like, yeah, I knew that. Um, how am I going to deliver these things? How am I going to install them? You know what the biggest one was? What if it breaks? How do I service? Should we acquire a servicing company in Europe to install in Europe? Should we do a deal? Should I raise some money, though, so I could sign a big deal with a partner? Does somebody know a company? In the end, through scratching and digging all by myself and doing everything wrong, I wound up signing a deal with NCR Europe, basically, because they service ATMs everywhere. They're already in every location. They already know kiosks, and I wound up doing a deal with them. I could have done that way faster and way cheaper if somebody helped me put these deals together. So I'm just doing that as an example and funding all that stuff. If I knew, if I had a network then, I would have been able to show you guys, here's what I need to do, who can help me? And different people would have helped me put all those deals together. We succeeded, but we succeeded the hard way. I made every mistake you can make and I made it three times. Um, in the end, we still, like I said, pulled it off, the things got delivered. Um, this company was three years later. I mean, we want you guys to gain value for your time and your investment. Um, so I didn't really do this for money per se, but I was broke and unemployed in 20 something. And after at three years after the launch of the company, we sold it for well over $100 million on maybe a $2 million investment total to launch this whole thing. All of this could have been done better. That is why we are here today. So it's important for these entrepreneurs to know because they don't know this. All I wanted to do was build kiosks, right? If somebody had come to me and said, Jeff, you're going to have to learn how to do deals and you're going to need people to help you do those things, I would have been way more successful. And part of Alan and I were talking about leadership. Part of putting teams together is deal making. Absolutely. You know what's one of the number one questions I get from on the trip I just did? I got this in every country. From people growing businesses, they don't know how to grow the team and they don't always have the funding and they don't want to spend it all on people. Neither do the investors want to see it all go to salaries. So they say, how do I get people to join me? Guess what that is? Deal making. I say, make them a deal and they don't know how. In my case, I have no HR training and no deal training. I'm a software engineer. So if I had known how to cut deals even with people, I would have been able to cut deals with people to help me build the company. All of these are things that you people in this room can teach in our network. I actually fundamentally believe this. If we do this right, right, the whole world wins. Um, we can, we can continu continue to scale and deliver profitable solutions. The best part is when you do something that makes the world better and everybody gets paid for doing it. That's a pretty good win-win, right, when that happens. Um, but we got to continue to strengthen the system. So I want to share with you uh, sort of how this works on a global basis. Uh, well, hello, Vern. Welcome. Deborah, <laughs> how are you guys? I didn't think I was going to see you tonight. By the way, Vern, I'm in Denver doing this EO thing. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to share this with you because at the time I was, and, and by the way, I was saying the other day that this is why you don't let uh, engineers handle marketing things. I don't know if you can tell, but I am standing in front of the Great Pyramids um, and the Sphinx. <laughs> And I told my engineering buddy, get a picture of me so we can market the pyramids. You can only see the corner of one because we're not artists, we're engineers. And I said, the sun's too bright, move over there. So then we got home and I was like, where are the pyramids? He said, you made me move, they're not in the picture. Um, an engineer shouldn't do marketing. Anyway, at this time in life, I just want to share this with you. At this time in life, I was doing some advising for both the White House and the State Department and the UN, all on their entrepreneurship programs. And this was after Obama's Cairo speech when I was asked by the White House to go teach entrepreneurship to Egyptians. And I just want to share with you guys the true power of entrepreneurship, because that's what Alan asked me to talk about uh, today, to focus on. Um, so I went over there, and I was, my, my goal was teach entrepreneurship to post-revolutionary Egyptians. But I will tell you guys, it was a fail. Uh, they were not done with their revolution. They were still fighting a revolution, and no one was interested. And the reason I have that picture up is because I was wandering the streets of Cairo, and I felt like a peddler walking around saying, entrepreneurship, who wants some? Come and get it. And Egyptians were pretty much do dodging bullets and saying, we're fighting a revolution. Can you come back after dinner? I and mean, I literally felt like an idiot, right? I was doing my assignment, so I'll call the White House and say, it's a fail. No one wants entrepreneurship. But I parked my proverbial cart, and there was a young Egyptian woman I was standing with named Mai. And I said to Mai, I said, I give up. I won't pitch this to you anymore. I said, but what do you want to do? She said, I want to fix Egypt. I said, what's your dream? And she said, 
to create a better Egypt than what I grew up in. And I said, how? She said, oh, I got ideas. I know how to fix a lot of things in this country. I just don't know how. I don't know how to put it together. Back to execution again. So I, I said, well, tell me about it. And she said, Jeff, come with me. And she walked me down to Tahrir Square. And she literally, we got to the square and she said, right here. And she pointed and to the concrete in the square. I said, right here, what? And this young Egyptian girl said, right here, I held my brother in my arms while he bled to death the night of the revolution. The soldiers shot him through the throat. And my heart just sank. And then she goes, Mr. Hoffman, can I show you my startup idea? And I was like, whoa, can I catch my breath? And I said, I don't understand. How do you go from that to this? And she said, you don't understand. That's why we did this. She said, we risked our lives and fought a revolution so that we would be free to address the problems of Egypt ourselves, to be free from the government so we could go fix things. And that's what I want to do now. So I, I have been mentoring her ever since. Uh, she has a company that basically, I won't waste your, in the interest of time, I won't go through it, but she serves Muslim women, especially repressed Muslim women who can't leave their homes. She has now served, since that year, her company has now served one million Muslim women around the world. It is incredible what happens if we build the ecosystem of deals and of support and of mentorship around the people that want to get something done, whatever the solution is. Um, I have that up there because when I went back, it wasn't Obama, it was Hillary at the time. I went back and the State Department said, what have you learned about entrepreneurship on a global basis? And that's what I wrote on the wall in Hillary's office. Um, I wrote entrepreneurship is the shovel you use. It's a tool set, right? When people ask me, Jeff, what do you do for a living now? I tell people I'm a shovel salesman now, except that we give them away free. Our job is to put a shovel, the shovel of entrepreneurship, in as many people's hands as we can and teach them how to use them. That is why we are here. That is why I try to do whatever I can to support EO, because you guys are the ones that have the shovels, fund the shovels, know how to use the shovels, because you've been using one for years. The more people that you guys can teach how to do this, the more problems will be solved. I'll share one more with you, um, because in this five-year trip I was taking, I was in Peru. That's outside of Lima. And when I was outside of Lima, um, these people came to me and they said, Jeff, these young Peruvians, they said, this little girl, Mariana, this young teenage girl wants to meet you. And I said, fine, I'll meet her. So they took me there. Um, that is how the poor live in South America, if you haven't been there. They live on these hillsides that the government doesn't want, and the people that can build houses, which is only 5%. The other 95% live in homes made of trash. As you can see, there is no water, there is no plumbing, no electricity in those houses. Mariana was one of these little girls that lived there. And Mariana one day asked her parents, so when I met her, she told me her story, and I met her up there. She asked her parents, do we have any money? And her parents said, what little we have, we're using to send your brother to the city to go to school so he can get out of this and have a shot at a life. And Mariana said, okay, then when I'm old enough, you'll send me. And her mother said, we need to talk. And this is true, guys, if you've ever been there. She said, we don't send young girls in poor South America to school. She said, why not? I'm smarter than my brother. She said, it just doesn't work that way. Only we send the boys. She said, then what's my future? And her mother said, well, you're looking at it. And this little girl said, wait, so I'm gonna just live in a trash house, have kids and hope one's a son so we can have a shot at a life? And her mother said, it's been that way for generations. And this young girl said, I'm solving that problem. She said, not anymore, I wanna do something. So when I met Mariana, let me tell you what she had just done. She had been walking every day from there to walk to Lima is two and a half hours to the public library to use a free computer, and she did that every day for six months and she taught herself to write code. So she created her own job, but the cool part was when I met her, I felt like saying, well, then you're done, you're good, you can go get a good job. She said, no, 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 I didn't do this for me. I wanna solve the structural problem here. And I said, what are you doing? You know what she does when I met her then? She goes to these houses, she interviews all the teenage Peruvian girls, she takes all the smart ones, they all walk into town five hours round trip a day and she runs a rogue coding school in an abandoned building where she is illegally squatting. Today, that's when I met her. Today she has seven, well, here's one of them. I went down there recently to check on the girls. I don't know if you can see, I'm up in the top of that picture. These are all low income girls that came from those houses that are now seven fully funded guys. We had to put deals together. We had to put deals to get servers, routers, computers, trainers. 
We had to get literally to put a building together to get this real estate funded. She has schools now. Mariana's in that picture too. Um, by the way, the gang sign they're doing, we were just doing that for fun. That's the brackets that coders use when they write code. So their little, the bracket means I know how to write code. So they were just doing that for fun in the picture. Every girl there had just graduated. So I came down and threw them a graduation party. But here's the amazing thing. Uh, now these schools have been launched and created. They're profitable. And because they're profitable, she's opening four more South American countries. And guess what it took to open four more South American countries? People in Latin America to help us do deals there, right? And help her to do deals to get this funded now. So she'll be opening four more countries. Thousands of girls have learned to write code. They do so well. You might go on the internet and use uh, Odesk or Elance and order a website. It might be three teenage Peruvian girls building your website, but they're so damn good you'll never know the difference, right? Because she trains them that well. And these girls move their families into apartments in Lima with electricity and running water. They make more money than their whole families combined. The power of entrepreneurship is amazing. They all have ideas. They just can't put everything together around an idea to execute it. There's no way her idea turns into what it is, what it is today without an ecosystem around her to do these deals, to fund these things, to mentor here. That is why we are in this room today. By the way, I will say this. The, uh, uh, I, uh, when I was working with Obama at the time, the White House used to do this thing called the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Did any of you ever go to that? Obama did that event every year. Um, and the last year uh, that the summit was held, I spoke at it most of the years. The last year it was held at the US at Stanford in, in uh, Silicon Valley. And, uh, when I was talking to some of the people at the White House, they wanted to feature young girls using the power of entrepreneurship to create profitable businesses that make the world a better place. That was the formula. And they were gonna go around the world and try to find some of the most amazing young women. And I was particularly excited because I wanted to meet them, right? Obviously, I like helping them if I can. I wanted to meet whatever amazing ones they found. And so I just wanted to share with you a picture I took when I walked in uh, that actually had me in tears. So on that stage, as I was walking up, that's Obama on the left, Mark Zuckerberg on the right, and the two girls are the two girls I just told you about. Uh, that's Mai from Egypt, and that's Mariana from Peru. And they were selected. Think about where they started and think about where they wind, wound up. From a house made of trash to sitting on the stage chatting with the President of the United States and Mark Zuckerberg because you executed as an entrepreneur in a way that created profits that allowed you to scale to do more good for more people. Again, the reason that we're in this room today. That was absolutely incredible. So I'll share some last examples quickly because we wanted to have a little Q&A time. Um, I mentioned the ship earlier that we sailed around the world full of entrepreneurs. And by the way, we're gonna do this again next summer uh, and, and we need mentors on the ship. You are gonna come, right? For at least some, because I really, okay. <laughs> That's important to me. Um, so as we did this, I just wanted to give you an idea. We took entrepreneurs from all over the world. This, by the way, is our some of our entrepreneurs on the right from four different countries and continents, actually. And we're in an African village. And we're showing them the problems the world has, infrastructure, right? But what does all that lead to? Manufacturing, distribution, service, all the stuff you guys already know how to do. And you know how to do those deals. And that guy in the sort of orange cloth, that was the village elder. What I wish I had got, I already told you I'm a bad photographer, is to the left, they actually had a witch doctor in this village. And he's in the left, and I realize he's cut out of the picture. Anyway, they were learning about life around the world. On the fifth deck of his ship was an incubator to launch businesses. And we have a focus on turning nonprofits into for-profits. And the reason is, people say, I don't care about money. And we tell them, do you want to help? What do you care about? And they say, helping people. And we say, do you want to help 100 people or 100,000? When they say 100,000, we say, then we're going to have to teach you how to run a profitable business. So we're turning, our trend now is we're turning nonprofits into for profits so that we can scale them. That's all the stuff that you guys know how to do. But I want to give you a couple fast examples. In one of the places we went in some part of the world, this might have been India, but it's two all over the world. In these villages that have no electricity, uh, the women cannot make food in their own home because they don't have a stove. So they line up at a community stove and they have to stand there forever and the community stows poor black smoke. And most of these women, there's no childcare, so they hold their baby. So we said, what happens? And they had, we have like a 70% infant mortality rate because every day they breathe black smoke all day and the babies die. 
and the women die at a high rate. So these entrepreneurs said, not acceptable. So I'll just tell you, a group of these entrepreneurs literally launched a smokeless stove company. These stoves cost 1 20th of a community one. They're so cheap, and we solve distribution, we solve manufacturing, we solve funding. Again, the stuff you guys know how to do. The stoves are so cheap that the women have them in their homes now, and they don't create any smoke at all. By the way, the black smoke was not only killing people, but it was a social indignity that really bothered us because you could find a poor woman, she's covered in black all day long. It doesn't come off when you do this day in and day out. It was horrifying. Now they cook meals at home. Then another entrepreneur said, what if they don't have wood or fuel to burn? So you know what she did? She started a solar company, these are not hers, that has pop-up solar stoves that don't need any fuel. They're really lightweight, you can carry them, they cost nothing, you flip them open, they grab the sunlight, which is plentiful in a lot of the world, they focus it on the cooking part, and they're cooking at home with no fuel at all. No smoke, no fuel, no prep time, you just pop up your stove and make a meal wherever you live. Again, the power of entrepreneurship. Two more examples. Um, when we were in a part of the world where, where, well, we went to a village, and we were loud, and we was all these entrepreneurs dressed like me and looking like us, went to this village, and usually when we went to a village, everybody came out. We went to a village that one guy had his back turned to us, and the entrepreneur said, what's his problem? And the lady said, she doesn't know he's, you're here. And they're like, we make so much noise, how do they not know we're here? She said, because he's deaf. And they said, well, what happens to deaf people in Africa? And they said, well, we don't let them go to school, so they're uneducated. And they, the entrepreneur said, why? And she said, think of it this way. You're a teacher and you have 30 kids and one's deaf. What do you do? You don't slow down 30 kids for the benefit of one, so just get rid of them so the other 29 can move at a normal pace. Teaching a deaf kid is too annoying. They don't have special ed in most of the world like we do. So they said, how does he get a job? She said, deaf people don't get jobs where we live. They're uneducated, and imagine if you ran a store and all your employees could hear, but one was deaf. It would just, she said this, it would just irritate the customers so nobody hires them. They said, what happens to deaf people in this part of the world? And she said, it's a death sentence. He'll sit on that rock till he dies, basically. They're not part of the human race. So what do entrepreneurs do? They solve problems by launching profitable companies that put all the pieces together. I will tell you the punchline. The punchline is a product called the Solar Ear. Um, Solar Ear doesn't use, by the way, the World Health Organization sent thousands and thousands of hearing aids to Africa one time, and everybody could hear for 30 days, and you already know the end of that story. <laughs> there was like, they all threw them out when the battery died because there's no 7-Eleven in the Serengeti. There was no way to fix it. So this group launched a company called the Solar Ear. They created solar powering hearing aids. They cost next to nothing because the, the part around the battery was, excuse me, the most expensive part um, but guess what we had to do to get these produced and manufactured deals, guys? <laughs> Again, when Alan called me and said, will you come talk about deals? Absolutely. We had deals together. You know what the deals created? The funding and the partnerships for two factories that crank out thousands and thousands of these that I got a chance to present this on the stage at the United Nations. So now NGOs all over the world, NGOs and various organizations buy these things the factories and manufacturing had to be put together. The funding had to be put together. You know what's my favorite part? The, not my idea. Not my idea at all. The entrepreneurs came up with this. These factories are staffed 100% by deaf people. That's all they employ in those. Entrepreneurship really does change the world. They, I'm going to skip the rest of this. They cannot do it alone. It's us, right? We have to make this work. I want to take a minute to say congrats. Uh, to everybody that was involved, Alan, in creating uh, Deal Exchange. Again, when I first heard about this, I think this is a great logical next step. We gotta do these deals. We've gotta help these people succeed. And I wanna thank you guys. You guys are the, are the historic start of what I think is gonna be something amazing because when you start doing these deals and enabling entrepreneurs in your neighborhood, in your city, I showed you global stuff because we have eight regions here from around the world, but this applies wherever you are. Help somebody near you. Put deals together. Enable these people to succeed. So I want to thank you all for being part of this solution. I mean, entrepreneurs really are the, the creators of the next generation. They are the dreamers. They are the visionaries. Um, they are. These are the people that don't read history. They write it, right? We literally have a chance in this room to be part of writing history for wherever you guys live. 
of being the next generation of solutions. When I was standing there in Egypt or standing there in Peru and realized that the skill set of entrepreneurship was the most important ingredient in designing the next Egypt, the next Peru, the next wherever you live, even a lot of the conversations I have, Boo Boo is here. I talked to a lot of people when we were out. That's why, by the way, when we went on our little dive trip, I wanted to drive the, the three, four hours across the Philippines, so we, and we made a couple stops, so I could stop where the people live, not the rich people or the government or the big cities, and learn from people and talk to people that live in the Philippines. They have a lot of problems. You know who will solve them? Entrepreneurs. Thank you guys very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, Jeff, you are amazing. How long do we have? Absolutely. Thanks. We have time for we have Q time for a couple a. Of questions. So we're going to use this catch box again, solving a problem solved by an entrepreneur. And here's what I do: is I throw it to you, and you speak into the box. Who'd like to go first? Questions. That's it. Here's the Ready? Let's give it a whirl. Look at that. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for, for everything. That it's the box is fake. We just wanted to yeah, see if you would do it. Let's see if I'll do it. Oh, there it is. You can hear me. We're, it's a gullibility testing box. <laughs> right. And you failed. I failed. Uh, question. So tell me more about this boat. Like, that sounds super cool. Like, what's the process for making that happen? Sure so other people think there are that. three groups of people that we have on this. The entrepreneurs. And if people want to sign up to be an entrepreneur, they have to stay the entire summer. We don't want to give up a slot. So they have to sail with us the entire summer. We're shooting to do it again next summer. So that's one application, people that want to be entrepreneurs on the ship, and we're expecting them to launch products and design and build and create things. By the way, lives were changed. A lot of people at the end of the, of the, end of the three months decided to sell businesses, sell houses, move together, actually launch and grow their companies. Um, a lot of things changed. So that's one. And the criteria, by the way, is intentionally vague. The criteria is a three-minute video to convince us you should be on the ship with intentionally no criteria. Because if you need that much guidance, you're already off the ship. You already voted off the island. So we just said, you got three minutes. Tell us why you should be on it. Secondly, there is the second group is mentors, which is probably the most relevant one here. Mentors can give us whatever time they have. You can stay for a week, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, the whole summer. We rotate mentors on the ship at all times so that we can help these people turn their ideas into businesses. Um, and by the way, stops, like when we stopped in China, we did a demo day and we raised funding on the ground in China for stuff that was on the ship. You guys know how to do those deals, they don't. Uh, what I told you earlier, the entrepreneurs, let them focus on the solution. But if you're there, you can help them put deals together. So I was pretty stunned that when we were in China, because we had people that knew how to do deals on the ship, deals were done and funding was actually signed in China while we were sailing. So the mentors mentor, and by the way, they mentor in everything you could possibly think of. Somebody has an HR problem. I don't know how to build a team. Has anyone ever been in an HR department? I don't know how to do manufacturing. Has anyone ever done that? I've never done distribution. I don't know anything about Africa. I don't know anything about Europe. And sometimes it's, it's literally relationship. Everybody in this room has been through this one. My significant other is very angry because I work so much as an entrepreneur. Now that one, we just tell them, and you just, just jump off the ship, because we can't save you on that one. <laughs> um, uh, I, we didn't tell them that. They just jumped anyway. Um, there's one of everything you could ever think of is going to, question is going to come up. So nobody's ruled out, especially, in, by definition, if you're an EO, you've already been through a lot of the stuff that these entrepreneurs need. So the mentors are the second piece. We have a giant calendar, and we just plot. If you called and said, I got August 2nd to August 14th, we would tell you what part of the, you know, we'll pick you up in Morocco and drop you off in Barcelona, whatever. We schedule all that, and then we mark your skill set on a chart so the entrepreneurs know what things you like talking about. What experience do you have? What can you help me with? So the entrepreneurs on the ship are constantly going to the chart, and then they're trying to find you because they see what your background is. And then the third group on the ship is just staff. This is a large, complicated thing to run. And so we had some people that didn't want to mentor and didn't want to be entrepreneurs, but they wanted to be part of it, so they run the whole thing. They are ahead of us, calling every country, figuring out where are we going next, and what are we going to do when we get there. Um, so we did amazing activities all over the world, visiting. Again, the idea is entrepreneurs solve problems, so let's show them problems. So we had to pick what experience we were going to have in every country, and what we were going to do about it, and who we were going to meet. Um, other entrepreneurs, sometimes government officials, sometimes investors. So that's, that's the three pieces of the ship.
And if you're interested, uh, you can send me an email. Um, oh, I took my email, it was off there. It's just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. Um, but just put the word ship in the subject line and nothing else because we have a little thing that picks those out so it can send you the info. Uh, thank you for asking. It was a life-changing experience, but it's because entrepreneurs really do get things done. That's what made it so cool. Somebody else? Right there. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name's Meg Carlson. I'm from Boise, Idaho. Uh, my question is- I have heard of that country, by the way. Have you? Oh, thank you. Cool. Actually, HP. Yes. I well, went out there, well, yes, I went to that huge sure. HP plant there yes. before. And they're still there. Um, so uh, I was intrigued by your concept of we're teaching uh, nonprofits how to become for profits. What's the biggest challenge in getting them to understand what the real opportunity is? Beyond the, do you want to help 100 or 100,000? What's the biggest challenge? Um, it's just, it's, it's really focus, is they just don't focus on it. So I'm going to give you an example. It actually happened on that ship. We had some entrepreneurs that uh, found out in a lot of the world, people die because there's no sterilization and no surgical equipment. There's no clean room, so they can't open you up. If you have appendicitis, or your gallbladder bursts, there's no reason you should ever die from that. It's a very simple surgery, right? But it was for years, but people die in other countries because no one can cut into them. So they just die from it. So this group decided to create off-the-shelf, low-cost endoscopic devices that you can literally do in a, 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 a you know, an append, a, a pen, whatever. Thank you, appendectomy, I knew it was in there somewhere. Or remove a gallbladder, whatever, save a lot of people that were dying around the world. So. When they finished the device, all off the shelf parts, I sat down with them, they said, okay, we're ready, we got a product, it works. We actually tested it in some field hospitals on no FDA because these people were dying anyway. In the rest of the world, they don't need FDA approval. They're like, she's gonna die, you might as well try it, she consents. And it worked in the field. So they said, let's put the company together. So I said, guys, the first thing we gotta do is file the patents and protect this IP. Right, this is multi-million dollar IP. So they're all looking at each other, and I'm sitting with these group, and they push this pile of paper over. And I said, what is this? They said, they're emails, you better look at them. And I start reading through them, and I said, you crowdsource the design, are you nuts? And they said, well, we asked people all over the world to improve our design, and we sent it to them. I said, I can't get a patent now. You just literally killed the patent. Multi-million dollar IP, and you killed it. Dead silence, I said, all right, and let's talk about the revenue model. I said, we gotta make money off this thing, so let's talk licensing. They're all looking at each other again. I was like, what? They pushed the second stack of emails. I start looking through it, and I said, you gotta be kidding me. I, they were emails that told people, anyone in the world that could use one of these, call us and we'll get one to you. I said, you just gave it away to everybody free. And I said, guys, I was disgusted because of the generation I grew up in. I said, I, you just gave away, you had millions of dollars worth of revenue on the table and you blew it. And I looked at them, and I had a life-changing moment. I looked them in the eyes, and I said, oh my God. I said, never was your goal to make millions of dollars. They said, no, all we ever wanted to do was save millions of lives. So they would never follow a business template that's good for business. When I said to them, the problem is, as soon as you're out of money, we can't make any more of these, right? And they said, what do we do next? I said, you're on the streets writing grants and begging for money, or we could turn this into a business where we sell these things and use that money to make more, right? We'll sell them modestly, but when we turned it around, so the answer to your question is they don't think that way. They don't understand what a business model is about. They don't think about a biz revenue generation licensing. So we have to start educating them. And the, the, the entry point is, do you wanna save 100 people or 100,000? And they'll say yes, and you say, then I gotta teach you how to run a business that makes money. But that's it, they don't think that way at all. And that's how I learned that lesson, because they crowdsourced the design and they gave away the product. And I was like, that's not much of a business. And they said, we don't care. We just want to get emails back that someone's life was saved because of our product. But that gave me the entrance to say, do you want to save lots of people or a few? So thank you for the question. Yeah. Any other ones? They have to be within throwing range. Four hour, um, hours and 15. Hi there. I'm Noah from South Florida. So my hour, question's hour, around philanthropy and Obviously, you're dedicating a lot of time to helping people, and I just wanted to know like, what your thoughts are on American philanthropists and kind of the, the swing which I've seen with the giving pledge towards money 
and maybe not necessarily always solving a problem? Um, all right, I'm going to answer this. But I'm going to have to give the uh, caveat, the disclaimer, that these views may not necessarily reflect the views of management, OK? Because <laughs> I'm giving you my answer only. Um, my experience uh, is at, there are no absolutes. This is not everybody. I still think, again, just my editorial opinion, you don't have to agree, there are too many people in corporate giving. The question they always ask me is, where does our logo go and whose logo will be bigger? I get so much of that. And would you like to meet the people we're helping? No. Right? I just need to report back that our logo was on the thing. Right? I, I still don't think we're there. There's too many people that check the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, back. And individual giving, it's better. But one, we haven't solved that problem because people don't trust the system. If I gave money to this nonprofit, where did the money go? What did they really use it for? We haven't achieved enough transparency and a lot of giving. When I ask people why don't they give more, it's not because they don't have the heart. It's because they're not sure where the money really went. So that's a problem we still have to fix. I don't think we fixed it. And I, I think technology will help by creating transparency. If I had the ability, do you know World Vision? Do you know what they did really, really well? And why they're one of the most successful charities anywhere? Is they connect you to the family. And the child writes you a letter and sends pictures. And you can actually call that family in Costa Rica. One of the ones I do is a family in Costa Rica. I can call them and say, did you get clothing? Because I gave them money. They created, oh boy, I was almost going to say a blockchain like. Uh, <laughs> um, they created an end-to-end -end transparency and connectivity through technology so I can see where my money is going. Until we fix that, I think that's a problem still too. So people don't trust the system yet. Um, and then a lot of them don't care as much about the outcome, unfortunately. We still live in a world that's more prevalent in our country than other parts of the world, I will say, uh, that, that uh, you know, I want to put the bumper sticker on my car that said, I gave to the whatever, right? I, I gave blood is great, but wouldn't you like to know whose life it saved? No one asked that question. They just put the sticker on their car and said, I did my part. It's better than not having their money, but it'll be even better when they become engaged in outcomes, and they'll become engaged in outcomes when we can deliver outcomes to them better. Does that make sense? Okay. I think it's important. And it's, it has a lot of ways to go. I'm hoping, I'm seeing more startups attack that one. More startups are coming out and saying, we're trying to fix the giving problem, uh, creating more transparency, more end to end, and more options so that you choose where your money goes. I think that'll make a big difference. Anybody else? Do we, on the back there. There, good toss. Do you find when you go around the world that uh, if you don't get local entrepreneurs, you get cultural pushback from people on some of these ideas? It depends entirely on the product and industry. So yes, in some places, that makes a big difference, right? Um, that depend depending on the type of product and industry, if you're not, and that's where these deals come in again, if you're not connected to someone locally in that region, there could be products I could try to launch in Southeast Asia and Philippines that would fail miserably because I don't know the culture and I'm not connected. On the other hand, there are types, type, so um, my answer to you is very category dependent. There was a guy one day that was telling me that, we were on a Skype call, and he was telling me that uh, he just wants to buy, you know, innovation comes from America and the West, he told me. Uh, and so he doesn't really like to use products that don't. I said, ooh, you gotta hang up now. He said, why? I said, you're gonna have to delete Skype. He said, I use Skype five times a day. I said, yeah, it was created by a 17-year-old kid from Estonia. I said, he said, no, 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 I love Skype. I said, you just told me that you don't trust innovation, right? Building Skype in Estonia, who cares? You know what else came from Estonia? I don't know if any of you are Mac users, but have ever used Prezi? It's like PowerPoint for Apple. I was actually there when those two kids, we were doing a startup competition, and two young Estonians wrote Prezi. Apple, we eventually got it to their attention and Apple bought it. So there are products that we don't care. They have no cultural bias. Skype is Skype. It doesn't have a cultural bias. But there are lots of products. Travel is a big one in my category. A lot of transportation solutions. Every single country has somebody trying to fix the bus system. You can't do that globally. That's very local. So yes, we run into cultural biases in many industries where you got a partner. But there are some type of solutions. If you look at, at Priceline and Booking.com, it's in 200 countries because booking a hotel room is booking a hotel room. It's not really very cultural. How much do you want? How much do you got? You got a room. Uh, that one, marketing was cultural, so you had to have partnerships of how to market it. That's why it had different names in different parts of the world, but the product's exactly the same in every single country.